Protect your wooden clarinet and get the most out of your reeds with Bovada two-way humidity control packs. Watch until the end of this video to learn more. Then head to bovadainc.com and use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase of Bovada products. Welcome to the Clarinet Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and I'm here today with James and Graham Campbell. Uh, we do have some live audience members today. If you are tuning in live, remember that there's going to be a chance to ask some listener questions at the end. Um, if you're doing that, you're going to go through the whole debacle we just went through of trying to make sure everybody's on Chrome. So you've got to download Google Chrome, <laughs> and uh, then you can come in and, and tune in to, the, to, to ask questions. If you want to just watch, you can do that from a phone or a tablet or whatever other kind of device you, you might have. That'll work. But if you want to tune in, unfortunately, you've got to download Chrome. And I say that because I prefer Safari, but... Here we are. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for joining me today on the show, guys. Uh, can we just do a quick introduction to both of you? I'm sure many know James, who you are, of course, but um, um, also Graham. I mean, many people may not know, but James, your son, Graham, is also a fantastic musician. And you guys have been working together for a while. So um, yeah, let's start with maybe Graham. Yeah, I'm a guitarist and a composer. Um, and uh, my background is in jazz. I studied jazz and I've played in rock bands my whole life and done all kinds of different music um so we've kind of taken different different paths uh but we still find a lot of uh, common ground to work together that's fantastic and james of course i'm sure many know you but, but let's just get a quick brief intro to what you've been up to lately and uh and also you know i'd love to learn how you and graham started making music together uh, well, yes, I've, of course, for quite a few decades now, actually, I've been running around the world playing clarinet, and for three of those decades taught at Indiana University. I've retired there just before COVID hit, and we've moved back to Canada, so that's why we're coming to you from just uh, Paris Sound, north of Toronto, where we have our, our home now. Um, I'm not teaching classes anymore, but I'm uh, just last week returned from concerts in Spain, and I'm leaving again on Saturday for for more things over in Quebec. So semi-retired, I suppose one can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those listening, of course, I mean you're a Juno-winning performer. You've had the chance to play for I think it's like 35 countries now or something like that, and uh, just an amazing career as a soloist and educator. And uh, so I do want to dive into a little bit of that. But here we are, first of all, as the the sort of like a, I guess a duo. Um, and I think this is such a special ensemble that you guys have and um not only because this is now coming up on father's day weekend next weekend um but also i'm now a dad of two children so this interview means a lot to me because i hope to one day be able to play some music with my daughters um so james like how did how did getting graham involved in music start when you were when he was very young i mean did you were you the kind of father that sort of forced music on him or let him choose his own path in music or, or what was it like well, it, 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 at one point, it was obvious that Graham was a musician, I think when he was five. And both my wife and I said, look, because he just naturally took to playing to the piano, we did, it, he, music found him uh, just like it, it found me, so we can un kind of understand that. And he's really developed his own path. He, like he really, um, we basically watched him <laughs> doing it. Didn't didn't take uh, too much pushing or anything. We just watched him develop, and he developed, and he naturally went toward jazz, which isn't my main field. I'm mostly a classical musician, so it's been wonderful watching that whole progress uh, go, and really wonderful to watch uh, the kind of education that Graham education path that he followed, which is one of a jazz musician, which is quite different from a classical musician. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I appreciate that perspective. I love something you said there is that you found out, he, Graham, that you, he was a musician, not that he became a musician. I find that so interesting. And, and I think that that probably speaks a lot to your, your view of what it means to be a musician. Do, do you feel that you were that way as well? Um, yes. Uh, age, you... at, at, a, at a certain point, I realized that I couldn't really do anything else but music. <laughs> and uh, having taught a, a lot, I see a lot of young players coming through and and we try to identify those who are doing musician, doing music because they think it's something they like to do, or people who just have to do music and therefore are musicians. And usually those are the ones that Amazing. stay in the business for quite a while. My dad That's likes nice. to call it the disease. The disease. The disease. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually mentioned. I'm, I'm doing a book club now on the podcast. So I don't know if you've read this book. Have you guys read The Music Lesson by Victor no. Wooten? He talks okay. about like almost exactly this. He says there's 
there's people who play instruments and then there are musicians who can make music on any instrument. And uh, you sort of, you know, you choose your path of the instrument, but it doesn't matter what you do. You're, you're still a musician, whether it's in your hands or not. And I, I found that kind of interesting because so many times we, we view the clarinet, for example, as our instrument and that's how we make music, but we are making the music. <laughs> so it's so fascinating. The, the instrument so, is only our voice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's only the voice, yeah. So, Graham, from your perspective, what led you to guitar and, and rock music and jazz music? I mean, your, your father is one of the preeminent soloists of Canadian history um, and happens to play classical clarinet. So what, what led you on a slightly different path and then back together again? Uh, mostly I just wanted to rebel. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I always love... Understandable, like, understandable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I always listened to to the radio growing up and... You know, I love the Beatles and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, top forty music and stuff. Uh, and uh, so I think the guitar seemed to be kind of uh, I just I felt drawn to it. And I think um, as as time has gone by, uh, one of the things that I really love about the guitar is that it's just so prominent in so many different kinds of music. And uh, I feel like I've been able to just explore a lot of different genres through the guitar. Um, and clarinet is similar too, because you can you hear clarinet in all sorts of uh, different sort of musical situations. That's true. They're both extremely versatile instruments. Mm -hmm. That is that is very true. So as you kind of forged your own path, multiple genres. You've been playing uh, jazz, choro music, um, rock music, all these things. You play wonderful classical guitar, also. By the way, I've, I loved your latest album, which we'll probably talk more about. But um, did you feel at that time you were going to try and avoid classical music? Because you mentioned you came back to your roots a little bit. Was there a time where you kind of weren't playing it at all? Uh, yeah, I think so. Like when I was, uh, you know, if you talked to me when I was 18 or 19, um, I never would have thought of myself as becoming a classical composer down the road. That really wasn't in, in my plans at all. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I wanted to be the next great jazz guitarist. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, th I think because, you know, just growing up and, and hearing hearing my dad practicing Mozart in the next room and kind of being around um, classical music people all my life, uh, you know, as you get older, you're kind of drawn to the things that sort of bring that sense of home and that sense of nostalgia. So I, th I think that's that kind of explains why uh, I've been drawn more to classical music. Um, and as a composer too, not necessarily. I do dabble in classical guitar, but um, you know, within the realm of chamber music, I'm, my voice is definitely more as a composer than a guitarist. I think that's wonderful. And so, how did this concept, as a sort of like a family uh, project, come together? It's been at least ten years. You guys have been recording uh, CDs, right, with this duo? Uh, well, maybe twenty actually. Twenty. Um, yeah, or longer. <laughs> so was it just a natural thing? Like once you've achieved a certain level, you're like, let's do this? Or were you guys always jamming growing up? Or what was that like? I, I remember always playing music together from, from a young age. Uh, Dad, you probably have a better memory than I do. Well, yeah. We, we, you, Graham, would come in and we'd play a few tunes and, 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 and he'd always get it right. And I'd, I'd do my best to keep up to him. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we... We actually, I think, made the first CD it was just kind of a homemade CD when Graham was what sixteen, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and that that still that, that still is held up. It's actually kind of works. It was um, called Homemade Jam, by the way. Homemade, homemade Jam. jam. <laughs> you can't and you can't find it. You can't find it on Spotify. I was just going <laughs> to ask. Right? No. <laughs> I love the title, by the way. Homemade Jam. Is it a reference to jam? It's just a. It's just a pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, James. I, yeah. Yeah, I remember when uh, actually. A few years ago, I remember when Graham was playing in restaurants and stuff. I, I used to go in and play with play with you a few times, and and I would kept thinking that you know people in the restaurant think, well, who's this old guy, poor guy, has to play in a restaurant to make a living? <laughs> I didn't know that I was having the time of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I'm 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 thrilled to watch Graham on his path because um, in a way I had I had a lot of fantasies about you know be composing and playing jazz and doing all the things that Graham's doing. So. In a way, but never had time to do that because I was too busy playing Mozart and things like that. <laughs> but, so, but, uh, yeah. but so in a way, I've, in, I've enjoyed that a lot. And I must say, uh, 
it's getting to a point now where, where to play with Graham, it gets a little intimidating. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he's, got, he's got jazz musician ears and he's got composer ears. I have clarinet ears, which is pretty basic compared compared to composing ears and jazz musician ears. So, so it's, uh, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm learning from him. <laughs> what was that like for you, James? Cause I'm going through the same thing right now. I'm uh, not to go totally off topic, but I've been, my pandemic project became a songwriting project, which I've had for many years. And, uh, but you know, I'm a clarinetist. I'm not really known as <laughs> doing that. And so I've been working with this instructor I have and trying to figure out like, why am I so nervous or anxious to play this type of music for other people? And, we've kind of come to the conclusion based on actually a conversation I had last on the podcast with Tommaso Longquist, who's now a clinical psychoanalyst as well. <laughs> anyway, but he was like, well, you're using your, your clarinet mind and you have to develop your composer mind. And, and I'm like, or your persona or your, your music, your composer side of the musician. And, and he spoke about how it was kind of sad that the musical role split up really, I guess, at the end of the Baroque period, um, so that we now have this idea of a performer and a composer. So what has it been like bringing these together in your experience, and, and how can others sort of bridge that gap? And, and Graham, I'm sure this applies to you as well. Well, it's, getting, it's just getting off the page for the classical musician. Um, we're, we're really good with our eyes. We sight read, like, sight read everything, right? Um, but it's just getting getting uh, getting the ear more involved. In fact, I am doing a project now for Selmer, uh, and and it's uh, it's producing a video called "Connecting the Ear to the Air." <laughs> and so so it's that that kind of uh, that, that that kind of connection, which which as I see as as I see with Graham and his training, that the, the jazz world does much more than much more than uh, we do in the classical world it's not that we can't it's just that we don't do it that much and i must say the first few times that i'm launching into an improvisation and people are listening uh, it's 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 kind of frightening but 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 in fact as you as you go and then you realize that what charlie parker once said he said well you're only ever a half step away from the right note <laughs> exactly that kind yeah, of gives yeah. a certain, that gives a certain degree of comfort <laughs> or if, if you play you, a wrong you know, note play it again to make it a right note right <laughs> exactly, exactly and and maybe you'll 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 open up a whole new world of playing <laughs> exactly so, yeah yeah so it's um it, it that that's part of it so it's uh, i don't know I'm, i guess i'm i'm enjoying being a participant in in graham's world and also an observer of, of graham's world Graham, let's get your opinion on that first. And then I want to go back and I got a circle back question for James here. So sure. did you, with your jazz background, like, do you find that this was kind of baked in from the beginning or did you also have to sort of develop the ear and the composer side of your musician persona, if you will? Uh, I'd, I'd say the, the former, it's always been kind of, uh, yeah, from the get go, it's kind of just been um, one in the same. Uh, I kind of think of it as like a spectrum um, I guess because there's a lot of improvisation in jazz and, uh, you know, composition is kind of like slowed down improvisation or improvisation is oh, sped up composition. I like that. <laughs> However you want to think about it. We need a t-shirt uh, with that on it. That's, that's, <laughs> a good quote. that's one of those quotes that like you got to write down. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, yeah, it's not an original. I, I forget where I heard it, but it's. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't yeah. matter either. Stravinsky, right? He said <laughs> it's yours now. And I, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, co like coming up, I you know, from a young age, I would always come up with little ditties. I think there was a, I, I don't remember this, but I, um, I think dad, you told me once that I changed the ending to Ode to Joy when I was a kid. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I still feel some, some trauma there. <laughs> oh, yeah. There so you. I think just kind of inventing, you know, always, always inventing has always been part of playing the instrument for me, I think. I have, that's actually reminds me of a story that happened to me. I was taking some piano lessons and I got to the end of a little, very simple Chopin something, etude or something like that. And I was so pleased with myself for finally getting through it in front of my teacher that I also improvised the ending. And uh, she said to me, oh God, that's like spitting in a, in a soup that you just made. And I remember finding that very odd because I was like, I guarantee that Chopin or Satie or, you know, name your pianist, sat down and, and wrote these pieces of music somewhat like this at the beginning. And so I'm not in an exam, so who cares that I did that? You know, I was shocked. Um, but that's why as classical musicians, we have this sort of bad feeling towards improvisation, I think, partly, is that we're, we're trained as I musicians, like you say, to read off the paper and interpret what the composer was intending. But 
like you say, I think we forget sometimes the composer was slow improvising <laughs> and mm-hmm. now we're interpreting that. And it, do you believe, James, this is kind of my next question, that blending classical with jazz and everything else, is it our job to kind of make the eye music sound like ear music or? Yes, yes. Actually, when uh, people have asked me, uh, uh, you know, to compare and, and when, um, and I found, actually, I play a lot of chamber music with string quartets and, and we tour and we, and and the the uh, process of playing with a, a fine string quartet that where everybody knows the score and is, is free to, to do it and have, and have great ears mm-hmm. um, is very, very similar to, to improvising with a, with a, let's say a combo. It's, it's very similar. The the big difference is is that when you're improvising, you're using your own notes, and mm. when you're playing, let's say Mozart or Brahms clarinet quintet, you're using Mozart's notes or Brahms. Yeah, notes. yeah. Everything mm. else, and the everything else, the reaction, the interaction among musicians, and the spontaneity, is is the same, and except that you're again using Mozart's notes and speaking Mozart's language as closely. As, as possible. Actually, uh, uh, Graham once said, and I, I, I want to get this in because it really struck me strong. It was about rhythm, the difference mm-hmm. between rhythm of a jazz musician, and rhythm of classical music. And, and, uh, and he it was another interview that we did together. I think it was in Holland or in the Netherlands or something. But Graham said, well, uh, jazz is, is rhythm of the heart. Mm. And then he said, but classical music is rhythm of the breath. Yeah. And I, I thought that was really, really interesting, be, just just how the two mix, and particularly as a as a wind player. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, I encourage everybody to think about that a little bit because I sh- I sure have for the, the last three four years <laughs> since you said yeah, that. Yeah. It's a bit and of a the, it's a bit of a generalization, but um, but I think I I found in my experience working with jazz and classical musicians, rhythm is really where the biggest gap is between the two. And closing that gap uh, is, um, yeah, sometimes a challenging process, I think. But it's it's really interesting for me. I like. I, I find uh, I find the 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 classical approach to rhythm very challenging for myself, and I've seen classical musicians really struggling with the with the jazz approach to rhythm. Can you give an example? Do you mean like the whole ta ti ti ta method of training? Or are you talking about like the way it sounds? Or what what exactly do you mean? I think it's I think it's that um you know jazz tends to be more uh I guess metronomic like it's on a it's on a, there's a pulse there's a steady pulse and and the rhythm kind of um the real magic in the rhythm is kind of just where you land uh in relation to the overall pulse like a little bit ahead a little bit behind but there's always that steady that steady rhythm going along and then um you know there's a, obviously there's a lot more rubato in classical music and that's the part that I've always found challenging. Hmm. Yeah, there's a really interesting uh, um, quote or article by Fanny Davis, who was a student of Clara Schumann. And in this article, she describes hearing Brahms play, and she talks about rhythm, and and she really really nails it. I think she she says uh, an un, a metronomic Brahms is as unthinkable as an unrhythmic Brahms. She she says he plays freely. But there's always the underlying sense of rhythm, like an unbroken chain of rhythm. So you mm-hmm. can see, you can hear, uh, let's say, Brahms playing very freely, but always making sense. <laughs> and what drives that is, of course, the harmonies and the line. And, and so the pulse is different of the breath, as Graham had said. <laughs> it, it's, it's really an interesting concept. But when you think of classical rhythm as an unbroken chain, Right. Yeah. So every yeah, link yeah. connects. That's a flow. That's a flow in the rhythm. That's what carries us through. But the uh, and if that chain breaks, then it's unrhythmical. But it's not metronomic. All every link in the chain isn't the same size. Let's say it's different, different lengths and different, and it can move fast or quick. But it's always together. And I think that's uh, that's that's one of the challenges of playing classical music. Of course, is keeping that inner line going. Graham, you might know, and James, you might also. Do you know that guy Rick Beato on YouTube? He's mm-hmm. like an interviewer. Yeah, so he does interviews about like rock musicians, and he actually has a video about how he thinks the click track killed rock music. 
And I totally yeah. agree because yeah. you look at bands like Yes in the past. And one of my favorite Yes songs is Starship Trooper. Those three separate sections. You know the song I'm talking about? There's the intro. No. Do, 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 do. It's kind of an upbeat thing. And then there's this middle section that's kind of a little slower. But then there's this third. They call it Worm. And it's just like this absolute like jamming out like this is a piece of music like a symphonic piece of music almost you know it's totally through composed and uh but there's there's tempo transitions there's there's like it's amazing it's a really cool track so starship trooper check that out for sure um but they it's all free of a click track and it needs to be how could they have written a 13 minute song with multiple tempos and transitions between them with a click track <laughs> yeah you know yeah and so we've confined rock to like these three minute okay that's our pulse let's go you know <laughs> music is very dead like that and it's everything um, everything's quantized too like it's just exactly it's yeah. right down if the you want to humanize the it there's a button for that <laughs> yeah and there's no variation in how far or behind the beat you are and yeah i always yeah. found that funny the humanized button in logic i'm like i don't think that's doing what we think it's doing <laughs> it's almost the opposite but yeah. um that is so interesting and, and i i i see that it must be difficult to get out of though like if you're a rock like what like you're saying i mean if you're trained on kind of like there's the drummer playing the groove and you've got to lock into that it's very different than interpret in internalizing this interpretation of a let's say you're playing like you say brahms you've got kind of the pulse in your head but it's you're right it's stretching and ebbing and flowing it's it's very different and it's not maybe evident to the audience like like thumping their knee along <laughs> you know um yeah when we play like Graham city playing different sides of the beat we do that in classical music too, particularly mm -hmm. say if you're playing a concerto with orchestra, where you really have to be in rhythm. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, of course. Rhythm. Yeah. You want to sound free, so you can sometimes go to the top of the beat, so it sounds like you're moving ahead, or you can go to the back of the beat. Sometimes, let's say if you're playing French music, I like to go to the front of the beat because it gives it that flow and that liveliness. For, but if you're playing Brahms, for example, you might sit on the back side of the beat ever so slightly because it gives it that depth, and you can kind of play with that dial uh, that goes. So it's it's in that way, it's very very similar to what um, Graham was talking about with jazz. But we probably actually, when we can, we actually move the beat around, maybe perhaps a little bit more than. Yeah, and even in that. in um, jazz pedagogy, there's like this, uh, you know, you're really taught like. You're gonna. You want to end this song at the same tempo that you started at, like kind of the click track mentality. Um, yeah, yeah. Even if it I does think, speed up or slow down, you go back, right? But the reality is, yeah. Like, like you can listen to Miles Davis recordings where they speed up like crazy, or where they slow down sometimes, or like Bob Marley. You know, reggae music. We think of it as being really metronomic and groove oriented, but it also speeds up and slows down. I wonder if it's like a, a rhythmic tonic, like you return to that rhythmic tonal center almost you know what i'm saying like a harmony mm -hmm. rhythmic harmony or something you can go explore other things but you want to come home kind of <laughs> yeah 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 that's very interesting i didn't expect to get here in the conversation but i'm super glad that we're here this is very interesting <laughs> I, I have to say so i don't have much experience playing like choro music for example um can we talk a little bit about that i, I had another guest on a while ago uh kristen mathis de andrade i think was her or her whole name um and uh fascinating music she had a really great idea about blending i don't know if she's if she's done this since the podcast so i'll have to reach out but but she wanted to put on concerts where she would like play brazilian music and have brazilian food and i'm like this is a great idea where <laughs> where can i sign up for this but <laughs> maybe some caparinhas as well yeah i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> but uh so what has your, been your experience in, in like other genres that many classical players listening may it might seem a long way from where, where they're currently at as it does for me uh learning shoro was was um i was i guess i was drawn to it because because i like i said i've dabbled in classical guitar but um never really took it too seriously um but shoro it's like using classical guitar obviously and classical guitar technique um to a certain extent but with much more of the language of jazz but then the rhythms of brazil so it's kind of mixing all these different things um just like a nice a nice combination of ingredients that was that I found very appealing when I first when I first heard it. And James, how was this like to sort of bring home and encounter that in addition to the jazz and other types? Well, Graham brought me into Shoro's. Shoros yeah, exactly. Music. I've had students also from Brazil who get you know all excited. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know that? And um, <laughs> uh, and uh, 
what I what I had to learn is it's not bebop. <laughs> my first <laughs> play a lot of the Shiro lines. I I sort of I sort of played it like attempted to play it like bebop, and Graham Graham said no 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 you, you play it straight. <laughs> And actually, Shirl would be a lovely place, a lovely entry place for classical musicians wanting to get into more bebop because it's he play it classically, yet it, it's got it's got has has that sense a similar sense of time to to jazz. So it's a wonderful uh, entrance point to anybody who wants to learn uh, play. And the lines are terrific in all, in those those songs. All those short mm -hmm. songs are terrific. Yeah. I love that idea actually of sort of a transition book or something or almost like a method or something that would transition people from classical to maybe like you say through beat or not bebop uh, shoro to to jazz you know and kind of get people introduced to stuff because i think that's part of the, the problem honestly is playing swing yeah. you've got a lot of classical musicians struggle with that at first for sure yeah another um, um another aspect too uh is that shoro is unlike jazz you don't take improvised solos you just play the melody um yeah. but you embellish the melody and I think that's a really great entry point into improvisation is to just play a melody and then you start to make your own little variations here and there. And then um, the more you do that, you're sort of gradually getting more into improvisation. That's really cool. And I find that's one of the best ways actually when I, when I was teaching, I'm not teaching so much anymore, but I would have students that I was trying to teach um, a little bit of improvisation and things. And I would have them like, okay, see if you can play this, you know, Beethoven, <laughs> sorry, James, <laughs> this Beethoven melody <laughs> in some other way. Like, can you try and find a way to play it in three, four time? Or could we try it in a minor key and, and, and or change it to this or just put it upside down or multitude of things. But now you're kind of making stuff up, you know, and is it still Beethoven? I don't know, <laughs> but it's, well, it, it's yeah, becoming. It, it's, it's Stravinsky talks, talks about this too. And Stravinsky, we certainly think of as a very strict composer. He, he would, he really yeah. wanted people to play his tempo, his markings. But he, even he said, Very there's interpreter, there's interpreters and there's uh, those who execute the thing, the, the music. Mm -hmm. And he said, the interpreters have to also be executors, but executors need to be interpreters, which is I found really interesting coming from him, uh, particularly. So it's 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 the it's the question it's the balance. So. Taking, taking, let's say your, your example of Beethoven and doing different things with it. We still, even though we may use Beethoven's notes and Beethoven's language, there's a whole world of room in there for our own thoughts to come in. And what you're saying about teaching and getting students to do that, I think, is is terrific. I think if that opens up opens up those pathways in the brain that lead to to spontaneous classical playing. Oh, absolutely. You know, I was thinking of when to bring this up in the interview. I think it's the perfect time uh, because Glenn Gould is probably one of the perfect examples of this throughout history. He's famous for his, some would say, bizarre interpretations of some music, but but those were his, that was that music made his, you know? And I once heard an interview where they said, you know, uh, did Glenn ever write any of his own music? And the person said, everything he touched became his own music, you know? Um, but I'd like, I'm not sure either if he did, you know, improvise and sit there and come up with, I'm, I'm well, Baroque style, probably sure. But anyway, James, you're one of the few people on earth to have really collaborated with Glenn Gould. So I, I, it always blows my mind to think about this, but like, it's just, he's such an incredible force in Canadian music history. And of course, so are you. And it's just, we have this amazing thing that happened. I, was it back in like 79 or 80 or something like that? Um, anyway, so you performed pr Premier Rhapsody with Glenn Gould, and you told me an amazing story about this when you were in Calgary a few years ago. And I kind of want to just see if we can repeat that here on the podcast for those listening. So what was it like working with Glenn Gould and playing that piece and and, and Premier Rhapsody filmed live with Glenn Gould? Well, it, yeah, it, it, uh, Glenn was the kind of guy, you'd be with him for five minutes, you have an hour of stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely. But, but first of all, it was a wonderful person. It was always fun to be to be with him. He loved to tell jokes and very relaxed and 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 certainly nothing like what you see when he plays the piano, <laughs> because he's in another world when he plays the piano. And when you play with him, he goes into that world. And uh, again, if uh, if if one is open to it, which of course uh, <laughs> who wouldn't be, uh, you can you can enter that world as much as your ability allows you to. <laughs> um, 
But uh, no, uh, odd kind of things. Our first rehearsal was singing on the telephone. He, he phoned me up and said, could you sing the opening? And so I started to sing. He started to sing. We went right through the whole piece. And he said, OK, we'll see you at the studio. So that was our first. I hadn't met him yet, but, you know, that's our that was our first rehearsal. Um, get to the rehearsal. He, he, uh, and it's funny. He was thinking of himself as an accompanist. <laughs> so he said, <laughs> well, what would you like here? What would you like here? And I go, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but as soon as he started to play you learned very quickly if you wanted it to work you went with him because his personality was so strong and yeah. and and willingly went with him of course um and so that was it was great but one one instance which i will always remember and uh, is that we were rehearsing and he, li he liked to play a uh, play games sometimes so he said jim guess this tune <laughs> So he started to play, and he started to play something from the Strauss opera. I guess it was a transcription that he was working on. And he played for a good 10, 15 minutes. And so I'm thinking, I'm standing next to him thinking, well, uh, well, we should be rehearsing. Then I think, wait a minute, you idiot. You're probably the only person in the world that's hearing Glenn Gould play live right now, and you're three feet away from him. It's just two of you in a room. Remember this. And, uh, and I do. To this day, we're now, what, 40? years later or so, um, uh, I can remember the incredible power of concentration that came from him. So when you watch all the videos of him playing, you see you see this kind of incredible concentration. Um, and, he, and he looks a little weird doing it, you know, this piano bench and everything. But it's, um, it's real. It's real. He'd be talking to you, telling jokes, and then he'd sit, turn on the piano, play there, and boom, this thing would happen. And it was an incredible power. So I kind of think, this is what genius is like. <laughs> this must be what makes genius. It's this incredible power of concentration. And and I, we did work for, uh, on and off for four or five years. I got to do Pierre Lunaire with him and some, some other pieces too. And and uh, But always there was this 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 otherworldly power of concentration. So, yes, he would have made music. He did make music his own. I I, I think he, he couldn't help it. <laughs> but I yeah, kind of yeah. think I kind of think that this incredible power of concentration that he had would be the kind of that the great composers had. Like imagine Bach writing all that stuff with twelve kids running around <laughs> room. Well, yeah. and, and Mozart well, writing it's, and it's... Mozart in a carriage, you know, going over bumpy roads and, and, and you know and, and you know, they must have had this incredible sense of concentration, which is which is in fact otherworldly. It really is. Well, it's so remarkable. And, you know, for those who aren't familiar with Glenn Gould, he was famous for some reason for being very antisocial, but then very chatty on the phone he would call people at all hours of the day this is you know documented well, yeah, I, I was a um, recipient of some of those phone calls <laughs> and you could you could put yeah, the phone just... down and go walking around and come back and he'd still be talking <laughs> <laughs> no this is a, such a strange thing and you know i guess that's just how he chose to connect with the world it was a, probably an easier way to communicate but something he clearly enjoyed doing so interesting but um yeah i just find it it's totally fascinating the whole experience and and uh and, you know, to, to have worked with someone like that. And you mentioned how it made you learn to live in the moment. And did that lesson kind of stuck with you. I think that's such a powerful thing because so often in life we're like, yeah, you know, checking the time. What time is it? You know, which one's this over kind of thing. And and I had a similar experience watching a Radiohead concert of all things. I would planned to go down there and, and, and be there. And I found myself obsessed with like, what song is coming next? And are they going to play my favorite song? And, oh, my God, someone's standing up in my way dancing. And then finally I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute someone's dancing and joining the music here i am at this concert i saved up and tra traveled halfway around the world to go to why didn't i just watch the concert <laughs> and <laughs> it was such a weird mind moment because i was like yeah we that's what they mean by struggling to be in the present like you're always thinking about the past or the future or something like that and there was even an onion article recently where they said woman who tries to live in the present keeps getting disrupted by future moments <laughs> <laughs> and uh it reminded me of that whole experience but but that's just so amazing that you were you know standing there listening to this this you know brilliant performer who many people on earth could not even pay to see because he stopped touring you know stopped playing live and yet there he is playing live and just that i think that's such a powerful realization so i was lucky i was fortunate <laughs>
That's very, very interesting. Yeah. And, you know, he was fortunate too, because you're a great clarinetist. And I think that they couldn't have chosen a, you know, better musician to work with back then. And that's, that's amazing. And uh, Pure Lunaire, I'd love to hear that recording. Is it uh, on Sony or was it, it live? It is. It is. But I should, I should warn everyone, it was, it was made as a television one-time broadcast on CBC in mono <laughs> in a studio that, oh. was, that was probably, like Lynn, as you know, is a hypochondriac and he didn't want any fans or anything on. So the studio was probably 30 degrees at least Oh wow! <laughs> under the television lights. And we did it in four sections. And I think that the, uh, uh, I don't even think Glenn chose the takes. I think the producer chose the takes for the visuals. Mm -hmm. So, and that, interesting, you know, so I, I, I mean, I listened to it and I say, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but then you know that's, we'll to... that's, that's, that's 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 oh so you mean they chose the takes based on how they looked instead of how they sounded yeah. it was a, it was ah. going to be a one a one time television program it it uh, who knew that it would go on YouTube and there'd be thousands of people watching it and and it was goes on Sony part of the Sony collection and everything it very yeah very well, it became different. a piece of history. And that that turned out to be my first recording was with Glenn Gould and it ended up on Sony. But no pressure. <laughs> no, well, we didn't know. We just thought it was a one shot yeah. television show. At the, remember, at that time, the CDs weren't even around. Computers weren't around. It was it totally was, yeah. Was, Let alone it, streaming it, services. It was, it was, no, nothing was there. So we thought it was going out once, and that's it. That's amazing. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, part of Canadian history, though. You know, it became one of those things that they probably wanted to, you know preserve almost and there it is <laughs> so there it is yeah well so before we wrap up i just have a couple more questions i really want to just uh touch on your new album or the latest album i guess now when you first got in touch with me it was going to be a new album and now it's out mm -hmm. and uh how has reception been i listened to it and i find it just wonderful performance i think that the guitar is is very very interesting and relaxed i especially like the last track actually uh, the guitar is working brilliantly with the clarinet so oh thanks yeah Anyone who wants to check that out, it's called Palms Upward by Graham Campbell on, on uh, I found it on YouTube Music. I'm sure you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or sorry, Apple Music. Yep, it's um, all over the place. But uh, yeah, tell me all about this project. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the first, um, first album I've released just of entirely original music. Uh, we, we did an album together, I guess it was around 10 years ago now, um, which is kind of a smorgasbord of original music, jazz, uh, Brazilian choro, just kind of like uh, a bunch of stif different stuff on on that album. That one's called As You Near Me, which is also up on uh, all the streaming services. Um, but this one was mostly just music that I composed during the pandemic, um, and it's all chamber music. And um, I only I only play on two of the pieces actually. I play guitar on the one on the last one that you mentioned. And then I play piano on another one, and the rest of it I was just um, composing and producing. And there's a couple, uh, there's a couple clarinet features on there as well. The title track "Palms Upward" is is a bit of a clarinet feature. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it sounds wonderful. And so, so James, what was it like recording that music and and realizing these pieces that were written by your composer or by your son, who's of course the composer? Well, that, I had I I I used my best read. <laughs> and I think <laughs> all, 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 all clarinetists will understand that. I made sure I had a good read, and the clarinet was working. And and you're thinking you're you're, you're playing your son's music. Don't be the one to mess it up. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I came as prepared as I could possibly be, Graham. I hope you. <laughs> I hope <that's... laughs> no, it's wonderful. How's the reception been? Have you have you managed to do a bit of a short? concert tour or a couple concerts uh, at least or no i i think we might no. um there might be a few pieces from the album uh at the festival of the sound in perry sound this summer but, oh, okay uh, Great. yeah so far i haven't it's funny actually because i because i didn't do a cd release concert or anything um sometimes uh like i almost forget that it's that it's out and then you know <laughs> someone will say oh i listened to your cd it's really great uh and then I think, how did you get a copy? Who leaked it? <laughs> yeah. Like, how did you get out in the world like that? That's yeah. strange. <laughs> well, um, it's it's funny because um, when I released my CD project, about, I guess it was six or seven years ago now, but even back then, it, people didn't really want CDs anymore. So I, I find it funny. We still call them CD releases in this world. Um, yeah. Nobody's where... <laughs> actually listening to a CD. But... <laughs> What's a CD? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Absolutely. But uh, no, check it out. It's, I think it was a really fantastic listen. And um, there's also some other albums, which I think you guys are both listed on as the, as the artist. So you can search James and Graham Campbell on, uh, again, I use YouTube music, but any, any platform. Of course, the best way to support the artist is to buy the, the music directly. Uh, do you guys have a Bandcamp page or? Um, yes, I have a Bandcamp. Yes? Yep. Okay, maybe send me that link and I'll throw it up in the, sure, in yeah. the show notes for yeah for this episode. In, and in if, the you, if you are into uh, physical media, I do have CDs available as well. Amazing. Yeah, you know, I like CDs because they can be signed. <laughs> you know, they can be, you can hold them, you can look at them. It's just yeah. something about CDs. I've always... How about albums? <laughs> albums, albums, yes, albums. like LP. Yeah, yeah. LPs. Absolutely. I've got some of those too. Even better. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> well it's been fantastic talking today i've got a couple little questions i love to ask at the end real quick and uh, i know you've got to go james in about 10 minutes so uh listeners i wanted to open up the floor to ask if you have any questions there's a button there you can click to to call in live um while you figure out how to do that if you'd like to do that um i'm going to quickly ask my five musical lightning round questions so uh we will move on to that now. So thank you to both for coming on the show today. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And for those listening after the fact, if you want the chance to tune in live later, you can join Clarinet Live at clarinet.com slash live. And uh, we'll be doing two episodes like this a month. And you can tune in and ask questions to amazing artists like we're having today. So um, my lightning round questions. And I guess we'll have to be kind of quick because there's two of you guys here. <laughs> so basically, if... Uh, or you can pass them back and forth, I guess. But the first one is, what is your first musical memory? And this is especially interesting because I think it's the first time I've had, you know, a son and the father here. So the musical memory is probably related. So Graham, what's your first musical memory? Uh, I think it might be listening to um, the Beethoven Lives Upstairs cassette tape. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> I played or, that piece once. <laughs> yeah, I think I, that's the first memory I have where I, I felt really the just a, a deep emotional impact for music i think we did that with the cpo here and uh i remember it was a terrifying moment for me because it was uh the score was all in c and i i was still a university student when i was subbing and i just showed up and i was like oh great i guess this is my deep dive into side transposition because I, I think i was subbing for someone who was sick that morning it was some kids anyway oh, wow. it, was a, it was a pretty stressful moment. i did it though it was okay <laughs> james what was your first musical memory well, it was uh, the first day of a junior high school band in Leduc, Alberta, and uh, everybody played the same mm. concert F, and it must have sounded horrific. But to my uh, 12-year-old ears, this was the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Leduc, the, uh, in, the, the Leduc International Airport is there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's, we forget, though, that like... The, the band programs in Alberta here are so, they have such meaning for so many students. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that that was your kind of big well, moment was. Being if the it band wasn't for program. that band program, I wouldn't have known I was a musician. So. Wow. Would have wow. Out. Amazing. That's fascinating. I love that. Uh, second question. What is the best piece of musical advice you ever got? James, you want to start that one? Keep going. On hmm. many levels. Keep going in the business, but also when uh, uh, making music, keep going. And that doesn't mean just stop uh, and, 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 you know, break down. That means, that means keep the music going. It's a very, mm. very simple I statement, like but very, very powerful on many, many different levels. I like it. I like that. Graham? And I, I think my answer is kind of similar, but it's to remember that uh, with music, we're we're storytellers. So whether you're composing or, or performing, you're, you're telling a story and you're trying to communicate something. I love that too. What was the best investment you ever made in your musical career, whether time or money or, uh, you know, a trip, something like that, James? Well, uh, that's a hard one to answer quickly. Um, was actually just, um, I'm going to say something that's going to sound strange, but it's getting on an airplane. <laughs> and, and all of that implies, um, first time we got on an airplane was leaving Alberta and going to Toronto to study, then to go to Paris to study, got on an airplane, uh, got on an airplane to go to competitions and, 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 and play concerts in different places. So in, in a sense, in a sense, a very simple thing, getting on, getting on an airplane to go places and take part in music. I love it. Graham? Yeah, and I guess, again, I'll answer with a 
uh, a similar <laughs> answer. Um, when I was 17, I came to Toronto to the International Association of Jazz Education Educators Conference, and uh, that was a that was a big uh, a big boost for me at that age. It reminds me of what Stanley Drucker said on this program. He said uh, something about saying yes always. He just said he just said yes to as much as he could, and uh, I I thought that was also quite interesting. And yeah, meaningful. you never know what. Yeah, you never know yeah. where you're going to end up. Um, what piece of music or album specifically, if you can think of just one? changed your life the most james that's uh, there there was there were many actually it's really hard to say there's there's one but i but i believe it believe it or not it was probably pete fountain <laughs> playing dixieland jazz <laughs> no because i believe had, it i believe it <laughs> he had such a beautiful sound and i thought oh a clarinet sounds like that it was like, probably that yeah probably when i was what 13 okay. 14 Graham? Uh, wow, that's such a hard question. Can I give two answers? Sure, I'll <laughs> Breaking uh, the rules here, those jazz musicians. <laughs> uh, well, okay, I, I can give one answer. Since you mentioned Radiohead, I would I would say, okay, computer. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a Kid A guy. When I met Tom York, I had him sign my copy of Kid A, and I said, I said thank you, Tom, this music changed my life. And he said, me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a for me, it's a tie between Kid A and OK Computer. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Man. That's the right choice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. What was the other album? Uh, I was going to say um, the uh, Borden Quartet's recording of Shostakovich's eighth okay. string quartet. I'll we'll have to check that one out. Yeah, that was, I, I remember just really listening to that over and over again. At a, you know, when I was um, at an age when I really wasn't listening to any other classical music, like like I mentioned, when I was eighteen, nineteen, uh, it just wasn't really on my radar. But that that uh, that recording um, definitely had a big impact on me. I love it. So, last question, and then uh, listeners, if you do have anything, you can click that button. Or if you're happy just watching and we answered everything, which I can't believe, then, <laughs> then don't click that button. But uh, we do have to wrap up in about five minutes, okay? Um, so, the last question is. James, and I guess Graham too, uh, what's your secret for humidifying your instruments and your reeds in Canada here where it's so dry? Um, I, I have a, I bought a clarinet case. Um, I can't remember the name, but it has a humidifier in it. And it's very heavy, unfortunately. It has, it has a humidifier in it. And so that keeps the, uh, it protects the clarinets uh, very well. Before that, just make sure the humidifier is going in the, in the wintertime. And certainly uh, where you are in Calgary is very, very dry. So uh, very dry. Just just have a have a humidifier and and uh, some people put oranges in the case. I, uh, I've done that too, but uh, just keep the moisture going. <laughs> I used to put the oranges. Does your does your case use a certain type of like um, system or is it just like well, a sponge it's or what is it? Same kind of thing that guitar that guitars guitarists use. I think Graham has actually lent me some of these humidifiers that you can put in, in you put in guitars. It works in the in the mm -hmm. clarinet case, and and the case stays at about forty five fifty percent humidity, so that's that's pretty okay. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, pretty neurotic about checking the uh, humidity level in my studio here. So I have like I have like three hygrometers and just to, just just to compare and make sure it's all the humidity levels good and then yeah I use those Diodario um, humidity packs which I think I Dad I think I got you some of those for Christmas one year actually because yeah oh, okay yeah, you just you can never have enough really of good. them you know <laughs> yeah it's great. yeah so the Boveda sure. packs basically is what you guys are using. yeah yeah that's great yeah. they are the uh, they are now helping bring the production to us here today so I. That's why this question's in there. I want to find out who's how people humidifying their clarinets, and uh, so yeah, they've been there. They've been great, and um, I use those too. <laughs> so, yeah. have you guys ever cracked an instrument, James? Have you ever cracked a clarinet? Uh, I have. I, I have one of my instruments is, is, is cracked. Yes, yeah, not not badly, easily fixed. But um, uh, I must say that I use recital Selma recital clarinets, and I have one from 1985, which was the first one mm. I had. And it's it's been solid for years and years. I can still use it. I still use it occasionally, and uh, it 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 just won't crack. <laughs> it's just great. And the A clarinet is the same. They have very thick wood, right? Like extremely. Yeah, yeah. but that thick. that can still it can still yeah. crack. I have a, a another B flat yeah. that I have is cracked a few times, but not not uh, dangerously cracked. It just little things open up. Graham, what about your guitars? 
Uh, I haven't cracked a guitar, but I've no. definitely had some some warping issues before. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Neither have I, but I, the, the, I bought a brand new Taylor a while ago, a really nice one that I loved, and then I just whacked it on my desk the other day, which my desk is solid bamboo, so <laughs> it made quite the dent. I was very disappointed oh, no. in myself, to say the least. It's yeah. also like a black polished finish, and I'm like, oh, God, oh, what no. have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, thank you both for coming on the show today. Listeners, I guess there's no questions. All right, that's fine for today. But um, if you do have anything for next time, do tune in again. And thank you for joining me. I said this was going to be the best uh, lunch hour ever today with this conversation. I I think that definitely holds true. And uh, although it started late, but hey, what's wrong with a long lunch, right? <laughs> so, but thank you, uh, especially to James and Graham for taking the time to come on the show today. And uh, I do want to also thank all of those who will be listening after the fact on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe to Claire Neat wherever you get your podcasts, whether that be on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, uh, um, Spotify is the other one, many other places. So just hit that subscribe button and uh, I will see you next time for more Claire Neat podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Claire Neat Podcast is brought to you in part by one of my favorite products ever, Bova the Two-Way Humidity Control Packs. I live in a super dry and cold climate in Canada, and so taking care of my instruments is a real challenge. However, it's effortless with Bovida. Every three months, I just replace the Bovida pack in my case, and I know my clarinets will be comfy and cozy inside. If you use cane reeds, there's also a mini version that fits inside most reed cases and keeps your reeds at their best, so they're ready to play when you are. Check out Bovida's offerings for clarinetists at bovidainc.com and use code CLARENEAT at checkout to save 10% on your next purchase. Click the link in the description below to learn more.